Hello and welcome to the Futurist blog. I am Ines Sully, your tour guide to the future. Gennady, do you think the true humanist party candidates can actually get on the ballot in four years from now? Is it ever possible at all? I think it will be a challenge, but I think it will be possible. And here is how. I think there's a lot of room for collaboration with other minor political parties, from the Libertarian Party to the Green Party to the American Solidarity Party to the Independent National Union that was recently formed. Because really, in terms of ballot access and electoral reform, we all have many of the same objectives, which involve lowering the barriers to entry for non-Republicans and non-Democrats. The way we do that is by forming coalitions to advocate at the level of state legislatures and secretaries of state to encourage them to lower the petition requirements or eliminate them altogether. Also, we can join forces in the actual act of petitioning, because why does every party need to reinvent the wheel for itself when perhaps the same people could potentially collect petition signatures from multiple parties' candidates. We all agree that the others' candidates should be included as valid, legitimate choices for voters. Right. Now, how far are we historically from becoming a major political party? Is it even possible to change this two-party system? Yeah, it's like, you know, it's been there for ages. It's been cultural and historical factor. And is it ever possible to change something historically stipulated? I think there are examples in history where the party systems have realigned themselves. In the United States, this happened immediately before the American Civil War, when the Republican Party, essentially over the span of four years, became one of the major political parties. Generally, it is easier to do that during a time of crisis, and we are in a time of crisis right now. Of course, I cannot project specific time frames. However, what I do see is an increasing disillusionment among the general public with both the Republican and Democratic Party. Simply put, those parties are extremely poorly behaved. They have given in to some of their most toxic and e extreme elements, and those extreme elements are not representative of the views of most Americans. A lot of Americans right now are voting reluctantly for either the Democrats or the Republicans because they feel locked into this two-party trap. Now, there are some electoral reforms that are possible that could get them out of this trap. For instance, ranked preference voting, where they can rank order all of the alternatives. And in Maine and Alaska, this has already been implemented. So uh, this is a realistic reform to expand in the next four years. But also, at some point, I think one or the other of the major parties will so completely lose the public trust that there will be a vacuum. What will step into that vacuum? Could it be the transition party? It might be if we're ready uh, by that time to really get our message out. So are you saying that you could use their mistakes to actually get into the slot and use a specific time frame to become another major party? Like, what would it take to make a change like that in the two-party system? I think there would need to be essentially a critical mass of voters from one of the major parties or another that say essentially enough is enough, uh, that they can no longer trust the leadership of that political party and they're looking for something new. And if at that point the transhumanist party can come in and say, well, instead of focusing on division as this other party has done, we will focus on solution. Here is how science and technology and a focus on longevity can help you achieve your goal, then we may be able to draw large numbers of people from that uh, major political party to the trans party. Yes, indeed. Gaining political authority is all about gaining human trust. Now, Gennady, in your opinion, what's the current role and position of the transhumanist party in American politics? How would you rate its importance on a scale from one to ten? I would say on a scale from one to 10, I would give it a three right now because we are a young political party and I'm sincere about that. We have a long way to go. When we started uh, with Sultan Ishvan, our founder, it was a one man operation essentially where he uh, created the immortality bus from a 1978 RV and he drove it single handedly 
across the country. He did all of these uh, impressive interviews with journalists from all over the world, but that was an exhausting task. The next stage of the Transhumanist Party under my chairmanship has been to expand our membership. We now have over 3,000 members. Uh, our members are among the most talented people in the world, I would say. So we have a lot of influence in terms of the intellectual capital that we have. And we've had a modest influence on policy already in 2019 in Nevada. We prevented a ban on microchip implants, voluntary microchip implants. Uh, so those are now legal in Nevada. And furthermore, I think we, through our commentary on ballot initiatives, are able to uh, essentially uh, acknowledge some of the priorities and concerns of the general public. So most of our recommendations on the California ballot initiatives in 2020 actually turned out to be the preferences of the majority of the voters. So that's heartening to see. On the other hand, as we discussed, ballot access remains a challenge. And of course, the major political parties still have many more resources and a lot more power, hopefully not for that much longer. Now, that's cool about the ballots, but do you think that the Transhumanist Party is seen right now mostly as an interest group rather than a serious political organization? And if yes, if it's seen as an interest group, do you think that the party would be able to lobby certain interests of the people in technology and science because of that? Yes, uh, I do think in some corners of the political world, there is the perception that the transhumanist party is specifically focused on science and technology policy. And there is a certain advantage when that perception exists that could be leveraged to communicate with politicians from either of the major political parties, especially at the state or local levels, where if the Republican or the Democrat in office doesn't believe us to be a direct threat to their position, uh, they might listen to our input on specific issues. And really, as long as the individual office holder is reasonable and open to new ideas, we're more than happy to collaborate with that person to achieve the priorities of the platform. You were watching The Futurist Blog. If you like this episode, please click the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Stay tuned. The future is already here.